We're ready. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the QSC booth here at Winter NAM 2015. My name is Phil Sanchez. And over the next four days, we're going to have a number of our Cape Fear musician uh, artists come on up. And today we got a real treat to start, which uh, is why we have such a big crowd here today. For everybody who's watching us on our live stream feed, welcome as well. Um, so we're, let's begin, shall we? Um, our first guest is a man who needs virtually no introduction. He is one of the most widely acclaimed drummers, recognized for his versatility, his technical prowess, and his ability to lay down the smoothest of grooves. Omar Hakim is one of the most successful drummers and session men of the last 40 years. Born in New York City to a musical family, Omar began playing the drums when he was just five years old. And by the age of 10, Omar was uh, performing publicly with his father, Hassan, or excuse me, Hassan Hakim, who was a trombone veteran of the Duke Ellington and Count Basie bands. Since those early days, playing with his father and growing up, uh, Omar has collaborated with a virtual who's who of musical, musical artists, including Miles Davis, Madonna, most recently Daft Punk, and has left his footprint on virtually hundreds of recordings, including a few under his own name. Joining him today is his lovely wife, Rachel Z. Yay! And the uncomparable Mr. Daryl Jones. And so a little bit about Rachel. Rachel is a renowned jazz pianist in her own right. Uh, she's a graduate of the New England Conservatory with an equally impressive list of musical collaborations, including with, with Al DiMiola, Wayne Shorter, and Peter Gabriel. Um, Daryl, well, we know he's a hell of a bass player. And actually, Daryl is going to be our featured artist tomorrow at 1230. So Daryl, forgive me if we don't go too much today, but we'll get to you tomorrow. So. I could go on and on about the amount of talent that's up here today, myself excluded. But please put your hands together and welcome to the QSC stage here at Winter Nam, Rachel Z, Daryl Jones, and Omar Hakim.
Thank you so much. That was called Listen Up, and that is featured on my last solo project called We Are One. Thank you. All right. Hey, am I there? Can you hear me? Two, two, there I am. Hey, give it up for them, yeah! Okay, so, first of all, welcome guys. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a little bit of a small stage here, so if I get in the way, Rachel, forgive me. But um, first of all, day one here at Winter Nam. Um, what are your thoughts? Have you had the chance to walk around, see anything? Uh, what goes through your head when you walk through the door every January? This is one of my favorite places to visit every year for two reasons. One, it gets me out of New York City, out of the freezing cold, you know? Because it is freezing right now in New York City. So it's nice to get that break. And it's also like a reunion of friends. Every time I come here, I see guys, Queens, Queens in the house, all right, Jamaica Funk lives. <laughs> but all, you know, it's just wonderful just to run into all of your friends. Not only the musicians, but also the people that you've had relationships with over the years, the manufacturers that have supported sure. you and all of that. And it's really important to, to gather at NAMM and touch base with everybody every year. Just see what's happening, check out the new stuff and figure out your new palette. Your new thing, forward. yeah. You know what I mean? Right on. And how about for you, Rachel? Actually, can we get this microphone a little bit closer to you? Oh, Look, there we go. And for you, well, what about your thoughts, uh, Nam? Well, uh, I don't think I have the mic. Is there you are. Okay. okay. This is the first time I ever performed at Nam. actually. Yeah! <laughs> I'm going to be loud. Well, so, so, that's all that matters. So you, you, you talk about being nervous. I'm the guy up here with you guys. I'm the person that's nervous. But again, welcome. We're glad you could join us today. Daryl, we'll get to you tomorrow in great extent. So. Man, talk to Daryl. <laughs> Come on, man. We can talk to him today and tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Here. So, we all love him. So, here. Here. Um, you started playing when you were about five years old. With yeah. 10, you started playing with your father. Was that something that was, did it come naturally? Did your parents encourage you? Tell me about those early years of, of playing, uh, playing drums or getting into your craft. Well, I was surrounded by music and musicians. As you said, my dad was a trombonist. Uh, jazz was the first music that I heard in the house. But when you grow up in that neighborhood, that was a a serious music neighborhood, I'm talking about Queens, New York. And not only was it a hotbed for, for jazz and improvisational music, but it was also a serious hotbed for funk and rock and R&B. Back then they called it soul music. So what was interesting about coming up during this time period was that the musicians were getting a steady diet of everything. You know, you weren't yeah. just specializing in one thing but you were learning different languages that would inform your musical personality. And I think that that's what has made my career fun, is that I decided a long time ago that I didn't want to be typecast as a, a, a musician of a certain genre. My goal was to stay out of the box in terms right. of where they were, to, oh, jazz drummer, nope, he jumped out of that one. Rock drummer, oh, we can't find, he jumped out of that one, funk. I'm trying to make my musical in, uh, experience as complete as I can. And by doing that, it has made my career really fun and interesting. So, um, so 
when did you know, or did you always know that this was going to be what you did? You know, it's, it's funny because when you grow up in a neighborhood like that, um, the, the, the music vibe was just there. You know, you wake up, you play, you eat, you practice, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't like... I'm going to... It just, it, it was. was. Odd. It was an odd experience because everybody was doing it in this particular neighborhood. I'm talking about a neighborhood, like Marcus Miller and I grew up together. We went to high school together. Um, Kenny Kirkland lived around there. John Coltrane lived down the block. Wow. People like Weldon Irvine. Count Basie had a house in St. Albans. James Brown had a house in St. Albans. This, there was music in the air. There was no getting away from it. So in many ways, it seemed pretty normal to play music. Okay. It wasn't until I got out there and I realized, whoa, okay, I guess what I'm doing is something different. Or maybe, because at that time, I didn't think anything about it. My goal was to sit down and have fun. That was okay. my goal. Great. Rachel, if I could ask you sort of similar questions. Um, how did you get into it? Was this something you always wanted to do? Tell me. I was born into a musical family. My mom was an opera singer. Okay. So it was very, very much expected that I would be an opera singer and play piano and all that. But I rebelled when I first heard Miles Smiles. There you go. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, what, it just changed my life getting into jazz. And I studied with Jerry Kowarski from Borg okay. over there, my first teacher. Nice. So, um, yeah, then I went to NEC, and then luckily when I moved to New York, I got in steps ahead, and I met these guys, and, you know, followed a lucky career path. That also jazz, I love jazz piano, I love playing jazz trio, but the synths bit me, yep. and so I love having a big rig. <laughs> and, uh, Amen. You know, <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. Yeah, rock and pop, it's awesome. Dance. Uh, so um, before we start talking about exactly how you're using the gear and stuff like that, was there a moment for you, Hakeem, where you said, wow, this, this, is, uh, this is my break, or this is the big moment I've, I've arrived? Was there not ever an aha moment that sort of hit an you? An aha moment. I, it's, one of the aha moments was very interesting. Um, there's a great uh, rock guitarist named Eddie Martinez. I don't know if you guys know Eddie Martinez. But I did my first tour with Eddie Martinez uh, working for a guy named Jay Mason. I was about 15 years old, so it's like 1974. And we were opening for like a band from San Francisco called Cold Blood. We would open for Sly every now and then, the Doobie Brothers. And it was incredible, you know, to, to watch these people. But then after the tour, Eddie and I were roaming around New York looking for our next gig. We picked up a Village Voice, because you know, the Village Voice is all over New York City. It's like the LA Weekly, right? But back then, they had ads in the back, like the musician classifieds. So Eddie and I spot this ad. It says, drummer and guitarist needed for recording and touring act. <laughs> Sounds juicy. <laughs> so we call the number, and they say, go to Carol Music Studios right now. So Eddie and I go over to Carol Music Studios, 41st Street and 8th Avenue, and we get up in the rehearsal studio, and I, I see two ladies at mics, and I, I kind of recognize them. I'm going, wow, that lady looks like Sarah Dash, and that looks like Nona Hendrix. Two thirds of a group called LaBelle. And I'm thinking, I said to Eddie, is this a LaBelle audition? <laughs> and right as I said that, Patty LaBelle walked in. And I went, oh my God. Okay, 16 years old, I'm freaking out. They had a huge hit out at that time. Lady Marmalade was the hit, remember? Yep. Right, remember that? So they, they asked us to play the groove. So we started playing it. I knew the groove, right? So we're kicking it, right? You remember that? You know that bass line? So 
started to kick at that groove, and Patty hired us on the spot. Yeah. Right? And then she found out that I was 16 years old. She said, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. I got a son 16. I can't take you out of school. But she said, this might work out because our drummer uh, had another tour and our tour got extended. So he can play the weekday gigs and you play the weekends. Yeah. So it was like my first kind of showbiz tour. The other tour was cool, but this was people flying over your head in silver costumes. Yeah. Lazy, you know, I was like, this is unbelievable. And you're ducking while you're playing. It, it was fantastic. So that was an aha moment. Oh, great. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the QSC, QSC and how you use the gear and, and uh, things of that nature. What, when did you first get introduced to QSC, start using QSC gear? Well, QSC was the culmination of a 10-year search for the right monitor for the V-drums. I started playing the V-drums when they first came out around 1998. I was probably the first professional musician to take them on tour. I was playing with Madonna at the time. She just put out a record called Ray of Light. Okay. She handed me the CD and said, learn these songs. So when I, when, I, when I took the CD home to listen to it, I realized that there were no acoustic drums on the CD. It was all what I call percussive noises, samples of things that resembled drum sounds. And I thought, my rig that I was using that had uh, transducers on the toms to trigger an Akai sampler, I could do that, but I had just got this drum system from Roland. This was gonna be a good time to test this concept out. So I was able to actually program all of the sounds and I had a very successful tour with her, promo tour playing the V-drums. But one of the first things I noticed was that it was very difficult to find speaker systems that were up to the task of reproducing the V-drums the way I needed to hear them. And all of a sudden, an electronic drummer becomes no different than a guitarist or a bassist, and that amplification now becomes an issue. And you have to go out and you have to find the right amplification to bring this thing to life. What was happening for me is, I would put the headphones on, and the V-drums would always sound incredible on the headphones. And I'd take the headphones off, and then I'd quickly put the headphones back on. <laughs> because the speakers that I was using, and I tried just about everything, wasn't giving it to me. Um, last, maybe two years ago, I was walking around the show, I was at the radial booth talking to Peter Janis. He was demoing some uh, pedals for the studio, different DI boxes and all of that. He had a, blaze, a bass player there. And the bass player started playing and I heard an incredible sound. And I stopped the demo, I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What are you playing through right now? And he pulls back the curtain and it's a little QSC speaker about this big. And I grabbed his arm, I said, you gotta take me to QSC and introduce me to these guys because that for a bass to sound like that in a speaker that size blew my mind. And then the relationship started and what I suspected when I heard the bass going through it came true when I started playing the V-drums through the system. Um, what I was hearing was the right reproduction of the range and the depth of the V-drums. And I'm using a, a KW-152, which is a 15, it's a wood cabinet. It's a 15 inch low end driver and it's a horn. But I add to that an 18 inch subwoofer just because I like to start trouble. Yeah, <laughs> right on. You know, when I kick a kick drum, I want to hear some sub frequencies, right? When I roll around the toms, I want to hear the low end of the drum set speak to me, right? So that was the first time I had really had that experience of the V drums sounding as good out here as they did in here. And it was a revelation. All right. The... <laughs> nice testimony. Um, earlier we were backstage getting ready and um, Rachel mentioned something. You guys do some small 
clubs and stuff like that. And you were talking about how now it's almost a must for you to have some K-series or some QSC products out there. It sort of helps you with your uh, some of your club work. Well, you just heard what he likes to have, right? Yeah. So, you know, the keyboard player spends a lifetime getting married, but not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like revenge. And also, like, if you just request QSC at any club, okay, if it's a big venue, they might actually have it because they have good taste. But a little jazz club or a smaller theater, they might not know about you guys. And if they don't, we request it on our rider, and I have happiness every night. Right. I feel good, I feel confident, I can hear what I'm doing. I can hear all the details of the sounds that take me hours to make. You know, it's yeah. very important. You're a really important part of our life. Well, that's good to hear. And, and it's not only loud, but it's also the quality of the yeah. impact of the sound. You can you know, hear the texture. It's true because, you know, you can get loud speakers. It's easy to find loud. But I'm talking about loud with the quality. You know what I mean? Loud with a musical tonality. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what we're really talking about. Yeah, because with the piano, it needs to have body. You know, like, to re we have all these digital pianos, but it's the same deal. They don't sound beautiful if you don't have a nice monitoring system. So to really get the emotion of what you have, yeah. you know? Yeah. K KWs and K-series are the way. K-12, K there you go. KW. <laughs> Right on. Well, hey, uh, do you guys have time for one more quick yeah, tune? Why not? Why not? Let's get it up again for uh, Rachel Z, Daryl Jones, and Omar Hakim. Okay, so check it out. The next song um, is on an album that Rachel and I recorded about four years ago, five years ago. We started a uh, a jazz project called The Trio of Oz. Everybody says, why Oz? O for Omar and Z for Rachel Z. Um, but we didn't want to just do the jazz standards. So the idea was to take our favorite alternative rock songs and turn them into jazz arrangements. So we'd like to play an arrangement of a song that was originally recorded by Stone Temple Pilots. This is called Sour Girl.
Before we let you go, because we're just about out of time, and well, again, thanks everybody for showing up here and for watching us on our webcast. But um, what's going on? Anything you want to talk about uh, in the, it's coming in the near future? Uh, uh, we'll be doing some concert dates for uh, my project, the We Are One project. It'll be billed as the Omar Hakim experience. So we'll be around touring this year. There you go. Um, Rachel and I are starting a new Oz record. And we're going to try to get this guy involved. Yeah. Because I love playing with him. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, Daryl. There you go. And also, uh, what else? Anything else? That's it. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> By the way, they're going to be over, uh, for those of you here at the show, they're going to be over, I believe, on the side here. Uh, signing some uh, CDs, uh, we're, we're, uh, 10, 10 bucks a piece. Yeah, for those who want to, yeah. for who want to get it. This is le uh, Omar's latest uh, release, which was We Are One, the Omar uh, Hakeem Experience. Um, and then Rachel's, uh, the, the, what they talked about, the trio of Oz, and I'll be there as well. So again, want to thank you guys for stopping by the QSE booth today. Thank you very much.